All right, I think we can go ahead and get started. Um, good evening, evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us on this very eventful night. Uh, we, we really appreciate your time. On behalf of the Institute for Integrative Conservation at William & Mary, I would like to welcome you all to tonight's lecture by Dr. Melissa Checker, titled The Sustainability Myth, Envi Environmental Gentrification and the Politics of Justice, which is also the title of her newly published book, which I encourage you all to pick up. We are so thankful to have Dr. Checker here tonight talking about her research, which is documented in her new book, exploring the hidden socioeconomic consequences of gentrification and sustainability policies. Dr. Checker, thank you for sharing your time and expertise with us. My name is Erica Garut, and I'm the program manager for the Institute for Integrative Conservation. I'm joined here tonight virtually by the IIC team. Dr. Robert Rose, the executive director of the IIC, Dr. John Swaddle, the faculty director of the IIC, Kathy Francillo, the administrative coordinator of the IIC who so graciously handled all the logistics for tonight's event, Craig Anzalone, the IIC development director from the Office of University Adv Advancement, who is leading our effort to build an IIC alumni network, Sydney Furig, an IIC research student who helped set up this event, members of our steering committee and advisory board, and several students, staff, faculty, alumni, conservation partners, and community members who are all part of this greater IIC conservation network. The Institute for Integrative Conservation was established in January of 2020, thanks to a generous donation from a an alumna who saw an opportunity to, opportunity to leverage William and Mary's interdisciplinary expertise, innovative culture, and tradition of public service to advance global environmental conservation. Our mission is to cultivate an inclusive community of creative leaders to deliver innovative solutions to global conservation challenges. Given the complexity of pressing environmental issues, we are taking an integrative approach to conservation that bridges disciplines, sectors, and forms of knowledge and builds connections between the William & Mary community, which includes students, faculty, staff, and alumni, and conservation organizations, agencies, industry leaders, policymakers, and local communities. In collaboration with these partners, we conduct applied integrative research needed to guide solutions that transcend traditional boundaries to not only conserve the environment, but also promote sustainable livelihoods and cultural traditions. Additionally, through these collaborative partnerships, we aim to, to prepare a diverse next generation of principled, innovative, and compassionate leaders who will advance global conservation. Tonight, we would like to invite you all to join the IIC Conservation Network by visiting our website to find about out about ways to get involved and to sign up for our IIC listserv. We are looking for conservation partners interested in collaborating with us on applied research and capacity building, students and faculty interested in participating in this applied research, and alumni and community members with, a, with diverse expertise who are interested in mentoring students and working with this network on conservation solutions. Currently, we're launching the first season of the IIC podcast, developed by alumna Anna Cashmanian and Professor Dorothy Ebis. We're advertising a suite of 2021 applied conservation research projects for undergraduate students next week. We have just advertised our first faculty hire an assistant professor in environmental justice who will lead the IIC in developing curriculum and applied opportunities in environmental justice. And we are working on a suite of events, including the expansion of the speaker series in the spring of 2021. So please visit our web website and sign up for our listserv to get involved. As we move forward in the realization of the IIC's ambitious mission, it is critical that we ensure that the meaningful involvement and fair treatment of all people, regardless of race, ethnicity, nationality, and socioeconomic economic background. In the de development, implementation, and enforcement of conservation policies, management, and actions, 
For our first IIC speaker series event, we have chosen to focus on environmental justice as justice and inclusion are values that are core to the IIC and are used to guide and evaluate our work. Tonight, we are so thankful to have Dr. Melissa Checker discuss her research on environmental justice, environmental gentrification, and the hidden socioeconomic consequences of the green economy. Dr. Checker is the Hagedorn Professor of Urban Studies at Queens College and a faculty member in the PhD program in anthropology at the Graduate Center at the City University of New York. She has authored numerous academic articles, book chapters, popular articles, and re renowned books on environmental justice including her book, Polluted Promises, Environmental Racism and the Search for Justice in a Southern Town that has earned several awards and accolades. Tonight, she will be discussing her work, as I mentioned previously, documented in her new, newly published book entitled The Sustainability Myth, Environmental Gentrification and the Politics of Justice. In addition, Dr. Checker has been an inspiration for and is committed to building the capacity of the next generation of environmental justice advocates in fact, we were introduced to Dr. Drecker's work by one of our students, Sydney Furig, whose current research project was inspired and guided by Dr. Drecker's work. Earlier today, Dr. Drecker participated in a student brown bag discussion led by Sydney on environmental justice that inspired William and Mary students to become advocates for environmental justice. So before I hand over the mic to Dr. Drecker, I have asked Sydney to briefly discuss how Dr. Drecker has inspired her work. Thank you, Sydney. Of course, thank you again to everyone who has joined us tonight. My name is Sydney Fierig, and I'm a senior here at the college majoring in history and environmental science. Dr. Checker's work on environmental gentrification has actually impacted my research in a profound way. I stumbled upon one of her articles over the summer and it influenced my ongoing honors thesis on urban parks in Richmond, Virginia. She is a true inspiration for environmental advocacy and I'm excited to hear what she will share with us tonight. If anyone has any questions for Dr. Checker, please type them into the Q&A feature here on Zoom, and we will ask her the questions at the end of the talk. Again, thank you so much to everyone who's come here tonight. I know that I speak for both myself and the IIC when I say that it is a great pleasure to hear from you today, Dr. Checker. Thank you. Um, thanks to um, Sydney, Erica, John, and Robert for inviting and hosting me. I'm just really excited and honored to be part of the IIC's inaugural year. And I didn't realize I was um, part of the inaugural speaker, one of, I guess, the inaugural speaker. So <laughs> um, that is really an honor. I think it's, it's great that um, I really love the ex sort of expansive mission of the IIC and the fact that you're including my research on um, the urban US in, in the mission um, in the and so I'm really grateful to be here and also to all of the people who are attending in the midst of a very tense week and a very tense night of a very tense week. So I'm hoping I can provide you with some kind of a distraction. I don't know how welcome it will be, but at least it will be a distraction from the news. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead, I guess, and start my PowerPoint. Um, Okay, so uh, somebody I hope will let me know if that's not working out. Okay, but assuming you can see that um, what I have up on the screen is a picture of the New York wheel, um, which, um, so I first um, became acquainted with the New York wheel about two weeks after Hurricane Sandy pummeled uh, New York and New Jersey. And um, it was, actually exactly two weeks after the storm that I joined about 150 Staten Islanders at a meeting that was sponsored by the uh, New York City's Eco Economic Development Corporation. Now the storm had just killed 19 Staten Islanders and many of them were still without power. Um, but they still made their way to the uh, meeting that a public meeting that night, not to talk about disaster recovery, flood protection, or how to protect themselves from future storms. Rather, they came that night to hear about this plan to build a Ferris wheel in uh, St. George, which is right near the Staten Island Ferry. And uh, the, the wheel was the brainchild of then Mayor Michael Bloomberg. And it was um, meant to be the 
largest Ferris wheel on earth. And uh, Bloomberg said it would be an attraction unlike any other in New York City or on the planet. It was supposed to be set 84 feet higher than the Singapore Flyer, which was uh, the current title holder for the world's largest Ferris wheel. I think it still is. And um, it was going to be open 24 hours a day for riders. And next to it was this uh, meant to be this um, designer outlet retail complex and also a hotel and a very large parking garage. So, um, and you could see this is where, this is obviously a rendering of the wheel right there on the edge of um, the coastline there on the North shore of Staten Island. And that's the Staten Island Yankees stadium in case you were wondering. Um, so there were definitely, you know, a good number of residents that supported the wheel and welcomed the jobs that it would bring. And, um, but a lot of the meeting goers that showed up that night were there to uh, state their opposition to this project. Uh, in particular, they were very concerned that this was in a floodplain. And uh, as one woman said, part of our island was just devastated in the floodplains. And this is actually going to be built in the floodplain. Um, everyone was worried that it, it was a car-based development, even though it was near the ferry, but they worried that mostly people would drive cars there and it would increase traffic on the two-lane road um, that took people to and from that destination. Um, and uh, a lot of people were very, who lived close by the wheel were extremely upset about it, um, not happy about these lights that would be shining on them all night. Um, so, and then other people, of course, were also just worried about the environmental effects of, of building um, another construction project in the floodplain. So in response to this, the CEO of the Wheel LLC, which was the um, corporation that had formed as, to develop the wheel, um, assured the meeting goers that it would not only withstand hurricane, um, 300 mile an hour winds, which would be hurricane force winds, and storm surges, but the whole thing would be lit by LED light bulbs powered with wind, solar, and water-based energy. Um, the outlet mall was meant to feature five acres of green roof, and they were going for a lead, uh, platinum lead certification. And not only that, but they, um, to top it all off, the uh, developer said that the wheel would act as a buffer. So it would actually uh, protect the rest of Staten Island, uh, or the area behind it from storm surges because it would break the storm surge. So this uh, was not very convincing argument for most of the people there. And um, they continued to just sort of look baffled that this project was um, being greenlit uh, so close to um, the aftermath of the storm as, as which had really devastated, not necessarily this part of the island, although there was a lot of damage there, but the south shore of the island. So now if you um, continued going along the, north, the shoreline, so this is um, the North shore again of Staten Island. If you continued west along the shoreline, which would be going this way towards the um, Bayonne Bridge here, you would come to a five, five mile stretch of land right here along the coast um, that uh, Burl Thurman, who is the president of a local organization called the North Shore Waterfront Conservancy. And she used to call that five mile strip an industrial girls gone wild. And what she meant was that along that strip of land, there were about 21 industrial formerly industrial properties and in currently industrial properties that were contaminated with some kind of hazardous waste materials. And all of them sat within 70 feet of densely populated residential areas. Uh, so, to give you a, so to give you a flavor of what was uh, there on, that, on the North Shore, there was um, a container port. This is a, a picture of a container ship traveling to the port. Um, so there was the container port there were, um, and which hosted a lot of um, not just these super tankers, these, these very large um, cargo ships, but also trucks that would come to the port, you know, get the cargo and take it all over um, the East Coast. 
So, and a lot of times these trucks would travel through residential streets. So that's a picture that one of the residents took of a truck illegally going on a residential street. Um, these would be diesel trucks. So the air quality in the neighborhood was, was very bad. Um, there were also two private in that five mile strip, two private waste transfer stations, a department of sanitation garage, an industrial salt company, a sewer treatment plant, several bus depots, and lots of um, former factory sites that now house things like um, um, ship repair yards, boat repair yards, uh, parking lots, things like that, storage facilities. So, but they had, you know, one time uh, produced lead paint, varnish, steel. There was an old soap factory, rail cars. So there was kind of like layers of, of contamination in a lot of these properties because they had just been turned over to other kinds of um, manufacturing or industrial uses. So seven of them appeared on the New York, on New York State's priority cleanup list. Another four had been designated as Superfund sites. And um, then a lot of them just weren't being addressed. The contaminants weren't being addressed at all. So one of those that was a particularly egregious example that I think is a good dramatic example of the kinds of um, ways in which this, this area was ignored. There was a site uh, that was a former warehouse for the Archer Daniel Midlands Company, which had um, in, the 19, in the late 1930s, the Archer Daniel Midlands Company made a deal with the US government to devote a warehouse on the site to store raw uranium that was being shipped in from the Belgian Congo to be used in the Manhattan Project. So the uranium, um, one of the shipments uh, spilled or it leaked, they're not quite sure, but there was radioactive material basically that, that uh, leaked, that never really made it into the warehouse. It, it leaked out onto the site. And um, it was covered up with topsoil and then pavement, but it was never cleaned up. So in the 1980s, um, the US Department of Energy surveyed the site because the site was sort of known. It was just not really very, not really publicized at all. Um, but in the 1980s, they found dangerously high levels of radium and uranium on the site. And then a later study by the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation confirmed those findings. And then another study um, later on, another study by the EPA confirmed again that there were high levels of radiation on the site. So that was in 2010 was that last study and um, they promised to put it on the first app list, which is a list of um, um, sites can con contaminated with radiation, but it still to this day has not been cleaned up. So it's covered by the, you know, the area that's radioactive is fenced in by this fence that you can see there, but it's also located right along the shoreline in a flood zone. So you can see that it floods pretty badly sometimes there. Um, so this is the kind of thing that residents were extremely worried about. Um, the fact that the Kill Van Cole, which is the water body that flowed along it was also contaminated and then also flooded often um, and with sea level rise and uh, storms getting worse, you know, the flooding was getting worse in the neighborhood. So, and, you know, so that mixed up with the, all the toxic chemicals around had people very upset about the environmental situation. Um, and of course, as in a lot of communities that are facing that much contamination, um, the people that lived in this neighborhood were um, mostly um, people of color, either African-American or Latinx. Uh, and their incomes were fairly low um, compared to the rest of Staten Island and New York. So unemployment numbers were high. Um, there were a, an increasing number of undocumented immigrants coming into the neighborhood. And um, about a quarter of the population in the area fell below the federal poverty line. So that meant that they lacked the economic resources to move out of the neighborhood and they also lacked the political clout that might have gotten more attention to their environmental problems. Or as Burl Thurman liked to say, we are way, way down on the food chain. So to me, this kind of combination of things of the North Shore of Staten Island being um, 
so, so close to the site of the New York wheel. And these are just some GIS maps I have that you might want to look at while I'm talking. Um, the fact the the sort of wheel development project came together with this um, environmentally, um, with this neighborhood that was beset by environmental problems with real estate development in the 2000s. And, and that nexus, that intersection of, um, of particularly green development and environmental justice is really what forms the crux of my research. And the, you know, what I, in other words, what I really have been interested in, in looking at um, in this research is the kind of contradictions of sustainability in, at least in New York City. And I think it can be, um, I think it's, it's applicable to a lot of cities across the United States and really across the globe. Um, so to kind of start off, I'm gonna just talk a little bit about quickly about environmental justice or what it means to be way down on the food chain environmentally. Um, and here's just some uh, statistics. Um, these are nationwide. So there's been quite a number of studies. And I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with them about environmental justice or inequities in the United States. Um, you can sort of read these really quickly, but basically they find that race is the biggest predictor of the location of an uncontrolled toxic waste sites. Um, and it's a, a bigger predictor than income. Uh, so in other words, if you look at like a low income white neighborhood versus a, even a middle income, income African American neighborhood, the African American neighborhood is more likely to host a toxic waste site. And there are reasons for that, which I can go over in a minute. Um, so that this is really this kind of um, just uneven distribution has been the foundation of my research um, of my previous project, which was really addressing environmental racism and environmental justice activism in the US South. And then this research, which is looking at how it intersects with sustainability. And here's another um, finding that's, this one is from, I think from 2018 or 19, a study that was done um, that found that, um, Latinx and Black Americans are exposed to 63 and 56% more pollution than they produce as compared to white Americans who are exposed to 17% less pollution than they produce. So affluence, it really goes along with the production of waste and um, affluence and um, racial background go with the production of waste the same way that um, low incomes and people of color go along with kind of suffering, bearing the brunt of that waste. Um, so the reasons for this uneven distribution are pretty complex and I'm not really gonna go into them too much right now, but um, they have to do with, you know, the sort of cumulative effects of, of various institutional racism that have been going, that has been part of this country for a long time, including barriers and in access to employment, education, housing, a history of segregation, whether through Jim Crow laws or restrictive covenants um, or through lending practices and you know, house, um, home insurance. So all of these things kind of interlock and conspire together to, um, to, to produce this kind of uneven situation. Um, and, and the lack of political power that might help rectify it. So it's um, a lot of people always ask me if it's chicken and egg, like whether factories come into communities of color, whether communities of color happen to locate near factories. And my answer is both, um, both things happen. It's, you know, again, this sort of complex system of institutional racism that, that creates that uneven geography and also like uh, perpetuates it and keeps people from being able to get out of it or most people from getting out of it. So I can give you a little bit of a closer look of how, how these things worked out in New York City, and, um, which I'll talk about very briefly. But in New York City in particular, um, the uneven distribution, and this is just a, a little sample of, um, this is waste handling facilities in New York and a map of where they're located. Um, and they're located in 
predominantly in neighborhoods that have historically been um, low income and people of color neighborhoods. So the South Bronx is a big one. And then this sort of area here of Northern Brooklyn, which is changing, which I'll talk about, but um, this is Long Island City, Greenpoint, um, Masbeth area. So, um, so in, in New York City, um, historic zoning regulations were put in place mainly to protect wealthy neighborhoods from um, industrial, from you know industries that they didn't want to encroach into um, these uh, wealthier residential areas. And it also set aside land for industries because at the time that was the main economy of New York City. So they wanted to um, make sure there was ample space for industries to locate and grow. And the idea at the time too, was that it would be beneficial for factory workers to live close to the factories in which they worked. So um, where you had industrial zones, you also had housing for factory workers. So that kind of juxtaposition of residential and industrial uses had, had a long history that was initially seen as being beneficial. Um, but as time wore on and um, industries, um, a, a technology changed and uh, the city began to slowly deindustrialize. Um, the the you know people the manufacturing businesses began to leave the city, and city leaders you know decided that they really needed to kind of redistribute the space, make less room for industrial uses and more room for commercial and residential uses because they were trying to uh, re shift the the city's economy to a more um, financial ba finance based and service-based um, economy because they, they, you know, they saw sort of the writing on the wall that the future was not going to be in manufacturing, especially in New York City where land was so expensive. Um, so in uh, 1961, they instituted some zoning reforms that would sort of really help with that economic, that new economic development agenda, moving manufacturing out of the downtown area that was especially the areas that were close to Wall Street and pushing that to the edges of the city for the most part. And then um, allowing more commercial and residential to come into some of these neighborhoods that were close to Wall Street. And some of those were former industrial neighborhoods like Soho, Tribeca, um, eventually the Lower East Side, the East Village and the West Village. So, um, in the meantime, so as this was kind of this shuffling around of urban space was happening, the city was also going through um, a very kind of severe economic readjustment, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. So basically, um, as you know, manufacturing moved out of the city, or and in some cases was encouraged to move out of the city or to the outer boroughs, um, and other things were going on like stagflation and oil shocks and the um, late 1960s, early 1970s in New York went sort of spiraling down into this fiscal crisis. Uh, and part of that fiscal crisis had also was, you know, uh, white middle class families moving out of the city to the suburbs and sort of being encouraged to do so through um, in various incentive programs. So as white families moved out and manufacturing businesses moved out and things weren't coming in to take their place in terms of jobs, you had um, poor people, people of color kind of unable to leave the city and stuck in there and often living in areas that were either industrial or now were formerly industrial, but in these areas that were still um, surrounded by or contaminated a lot of them by um, industrial properties. Um, and the more the city sort of declined, the less opportunities people had to be able to move out of these industrial neighborhoods. So um, in the 19, starting in the 1980s, as the economy improved, um, the Koch administration instituted some programs to bring people back into the city, right? Because the tax base had just kind of um, declined so much that they, they really needed people to come back in. So one of the strategies for doing that was to start um, some housing programs that would encourage artists out artist housing in certain of these formerly industrial neighborhoods. And it um, started off in the West Village and the East Village 
and the Lower East Side. And they sort of put in these um, subsidized housing for artists, hoping that they would come in and start to kind of reinvigorate these neighborhoods, which they did. And so soon you would have coffee shops coming up and, and clubs and art spaces and restaurants. And this would attract not just artists in the neighborhood, but also students and eventually other people who were coming in to work in these sort of new corporate um, enterprises or new business enterprises. So these neighborhoods became popular, they became trendy, and then people felt safe, um, investors felt safe in, in investing in them and suddenly you start to have turnover, gentrification, new housing going up um, and, neighbor, and property values going up. So that's kind of the early days of, of gentrification. And, um, you know, as, as these neighborhoods close to the downtown turned over, you know, the kind of the um, redevelopment process kept expanding to find new neighborhoods to redevelop. And real estate at that point had become a, a major driver of the, of the city's economy as well. So there was a lot of um, incentive and uh, energy behind real estate expansion. So um, after, so in the, two, in, you know, this is continuing on to the 2000s when Michael Bloomberg gets elective, elected and comes in right after 9-11 uh, where the city had a, a recession and promises to like bring the city out of the 9-11 recession by making it into a luxury city. So his idea is to build all this new luxury housing and commercial space to attract um, even more corporates, corporations to headquarter in New York City and make it, you know, this finance capital and a capital for technology. Um, and he really kind of came in with that plan. Um, and it wasn't until about 2007 that he added sustainability to that plan. And, and um, so he kind of caught on to this trend that was already um, something that cities in Europe like London and Paris, Stockholm were already sort of embracing this idea of sustainability. New York was actually a little bit late to take it on, but Bloomberg kind of saw that that was something that if he was gonna compete with other, those other cities then he would have to also make it a priority, which is not to say that he doesn't, you know, he also cared about the environment, but sustainability was also becoming a kind of urban brand that signaled this kind of global cosmopolitan progressive city, which was the kind of city that he wanted New York to be to attract these kind of young, upwardly mobile professionals. Um, so he, in 2007, he releases this plan known as Plan YC 2030. And it laid out a sweeping um, agenda for accommodating uh, a growth in population, which Bloomberg predicted would increase by 1 million people by 2030, while also retaining a commitment to sustainability. And um, he, you know, the plan included everything from affordable housing to park access to reducing carbon emissions. Um, so under this plan, um, much of the city was rezoned for higher um, and more dense housing. And um, a lot of that housing, of course, was ended up to be luxury housing. So under, and a lot, and it was, mu much of it was done under this mantle of sustainability. Um, so what I wanted to look at was really kind of how this combination of um, real estate development and greening or environmental improvements, um, whether that really helped the cause of environmental justice. Cause you know, um, if all of these neighborhoods in New York really needed these environmental improvements, then I thought maybe this would be really a great thing for them because maybe now sustainability was coming to, you know, to the neighborhoods that had been fighting for it for, for a long time. Um, so I identified in my research, three types of what I call environmental gentrification or the pairing of environmental improvements with high-end redevelopment. Um, and I, I'll go over them really quickly. There, I um, call them green gentrification, industrial gentrification, and brown gentrification. Um, green gentrification 
is the use of, of green amenities like new parks. Um, let's see, uh, maybe uh, bioswales, um, uh, greenways, things like the High Line. Um, all of these greening projects, that's actually not a map of greening projects really. Um, all of these uh, greening projects that kind of end up coming along with redevelopment. And that the reason that they accompany redevelopment has a lot to do with Bloomberg who developed these mechanisms for financing parks that um, allowed real estate developers to kind of um, help uh, put in money to manage the park so that they could really use it as a selling point for their proposals. Um, and other kinds of ways that sort of the city might pay for the construction of the park park and then new residents would end up helping to pay for the management of the park. So because a lot of these parks were really predicated on having affluent residents nearby to support them, you know, the, the ties were very much, it was, you know, very explicit that these things were tied to, um, af, you know, bringing in more affluent people to live near them. So the park distribution, the distribution of these green amenities ended up being fairly uneven. And what I also found that happened was that people in these neighborhoods, and this is a picture of a park in Harlem. This is actually a very old park. It's Marcus Garvey Park in um, um, central Harlem, where they, um, they refurbished it. So they kind of like cleaned up the park and, and made it you know really nice, which people who living around there for a long time were very happy about. But as they did that, they instituted these new rules that um, ended up uh, restricting the uses, the, the kinds of the ways that people had traditionally used the park. So this is a drum circle that had been there since the 1970s that was a big attraction on the weekends, not just for people in the neighborhood, but for tourists. It was very famous and well known. And but the people in the new luxury housing near near the park didn't like the noise. And so there was this big kind of um, fight between the people that were fans of the drum circle and the people in the apartment building that wanted the drum circle to go away. And uh, it left a pretty bad taste in um, for long-term residents because they kept kind of moving the drum circle around and eventually just lost a lot of its, um, it, it just you know wasn't as viable as it used to be. So people kind of started to really associate um, these new, greening greening of Harlem with um, negative things and with the gentrification that was sort of displacing them or making them feel unwelcome in their own neighborhood. And so what I found was that um, when the city came in to propose certain new parks, even like little small parks that normally residents would have really advocated for and have wanted, um, they started uh, contesting them and, and challenging the installation of the park and saying, we don't even want this because we know that it's gonna mean that the upscaling of this area and we don't want that. So um, suddenly people were insisting that they needed a place where homeless people could feel comfortable and, and hang out all day. And they wanted their kind of dusty old tattered parks to stay as they were. So it really put people in the neighborhood, the long-term residents in a very difficult position because they um, you know, it was like they either got these environmental improvements and then risked being displaced or they fought against the environmental improvements and, and you know, their neighborhood, um, you know, lacked the green space that they wanted. So that's sort of the green gentrification side of things. Um, the other kind of gentrification I identify is called, I call it industrial gentrification. And this is, um, whereas you know, for many years, the city discouraged manufacturing businesses and tried to convert them into loft spaces and residential. And that's still an ongoing thing. It's definitely happening more than it's not. But at a certain point, Bloomberg got a lot of criticism for doing away with too much of the city's manufacturing because manufacturing, you know, is a way to employ people who, um, you know, it's like a skills-based economy, right? So it's people who have maybe don't necessarily need a college or higher education, they can, you know, and can still earn a reasonable living. We know all the arguments in favor of, of this kind of manufacturing jobs. 
So um, they started reserving and sort of trying to revitalize some manufacturing spaces, but they were updating them to be what they called manufacturing 2.0, which in New York meant this kind of small scale high tech maker spaces. So artisanal food and um, people who made, you know, home, uh, a lot of distilleries making, you know, small batch um, alcohols. Uh, and beer, um, you know, pickles, uh, beard, gel, <laughs> all kinds of products that were sort of, you know, these sort that were sort of selling on the basis of being locally sourced, um, made it, you know, uh, again, on a small scale, green, organic. Um, and that I found became like the location of these spaces that were being remade as these maker spaces or, or for like clean tech or green tech businesses were very much located in gentrifying neighborhoods. So it became a kind of another attraction, um, you know, to be located near these like small batch places where you could go and buy your, you know, go right up to the place where the, whatever it is, is being made and, and buy from them. So, um, that, that, that kind of cleaning up of manufacturing and making it more, making manufacturing more environmentally friendly, which was a great thing. But again, the distribution of it really accorded with real estate development. And conversely, what was happening, and this, this also went along with brownfield redevelopment. So I have industrial redevelopment or industrial gentrification, and also what I called brown gentrification, which was the cleaning up of individual contaminated sites and remaking them, repurposing them. And oftentimes that also was associated with real estate development. And this is um, in Gowanus, which created from this old toxic site, this old factory site, um, they created a new Whole Foods, which um, very much catered to the kind of upscaling population of Gowanus. It included a record store um, a rooftop garden, a beer garden, um, right overlooking the Gowanus Canal, which is an industrial canal. Um, so that's a, a kind of marker of what happens. And so that, you know, and the way that brownfields work very quickly is they're a program in this case funded by the city to incentivize developers to kind of come in, they can write off the cleanup costs on, you know, they can write them off their taxes and they can get certain kinds of um, indemnifications once they've cleaned the site and it helps incentivize them to redevelop it. Again, a really great thing, something that environmental justice activists have fought for for many years because they're, they have, their neighborhoods are full of brownfields and they want them to be redeveloped and repurposed and cleaned. But by tying them to developers, um, it sort of made it, it, it disincentivized people from going into neighborhoods that, that didn't, where the property values were not going up. So there was really no incentive to go and develop a brownfield site in a neighborhood that wasn't like an up and coming and gentrifying. Um, and that meant that there, were, there was not a mechanism to clean brownfield sites in neighborhoods like the North Shore, which was not gentrifying. Um, there was, no there was no incentive for anybody to clean up the, their brownfield sites. So it really kind of um, left the, you know, really jeopardized the environmental health of people who didn't happen to be living in gentrifying neighborhoods. And this is a map um, of brown, completed brownfield projects, the, the purple dots and the dark red would be areas that have gentrified. And so you can kind of see how in, some places like this is Williamsburg and Greenpoint, a lot of the cleanups that were going on were in these red gentrifying areas or areas that were about to look like they were about to gentrify. Um, so I'm gonna kind of wrap this up now, but um, that's another example of a environmental gentrification. And then, so the other thing that, the other problem with this is that what was also happening, I noticed in non-gentrifying neighborhoods was that they were becoming more industrialized. So as some neighborhoods greened like Greenpoint, and this is a development that's um, being built in Greenpoint now, as these neighborhoods green, the, green then 
you know, any industrial uses that the city might have, because it's not like there's no need for any industrial uses anymore. We still need waste transfer stations and um, sanitation garages and sewer treatment facilities, but all of those kinds of facilities start going into the neighborhoods that aren't gentrifying. Um, and th those become fewer and fewer and further out in the boroughs, but, but they still are there and, and people still live there. So um, these neighborhoods are not just being sort of overlooked for being greened, but they're also browning um, where they're getting more, more industri industry coming in. And so in, on the North shore, that same area, um, in the time that I worked there, they um, they became an industrial incentive zone, and they were um, residents had to kind of fight off the expansion of a waste transfer facility, um, a new uh, two new cement plants, um, the expansion of the port, and you know um, a few other kind of contaminating uses that were coming into this area. That's a that's a, one of the cement plants that was trying to come in and tell, tell everybody it was eco-friendly, which I thought was funny. Um, it never actually happened though. So, so the, you know, so they're kind of dealing with, um, and, and the people I worked with in like on the North shore and in these both gentrifying and non gentrifying neighborhoods, like they were completely onto the situation. It was, it was not a mystery to them. It was no secret to them. And as one woman who I worked with on the North shore, this woman, Vicki, said to me, um, or she wrote this in, a, in an op-ed, um, wonderful hipster havens are created, waterfront parks offer diversion to the residents of new luxury units. Where do the displaced heavy industrial firms go? Bottom line, the areas with people of color, people without tremendous economic resources are paying the price for Bloomberg's projects. While our taxes support these changes, we do not share in the benefits and find ourselves here on Staten Island, once again, a dumping ground for the city's unwanted garbage. And um, the, the issue, I think what I wanna end with is the problem with some of these, with this uneven, um, or what I call selective sustainability or environmental gentrification is that it's, it's a short-sighted way of approaching sustainability, and it's obviously addressing one, only one small aspect of sustainability. It's not addressing the, so, the need for social sustainability, and it's not even really looking long-term at ecological sustainability because the construction of all these projects takes up a lot of natural resources and emits a lot of pollution and uses a lot of um, resources. So really it doesn't just affect the people in non-gentrifying neighborhoods or low-income people or communities of color, it really affects all of us. And um, so the struggles of these activists I worked with to challenge these projects are not just on their own behalf, they're on behalf of, of everyone. Um, as one man said to me in Williamsburg, um, which a neighborhood which has uh, radically gentrified over the past 10 or 15 years, um, and he was very worried that it still contained some contaminated sites and that all of these um, hipsters had moved in. And he said to me, babies, now the hipsters are having babies. And he was very worried about, so he was very worried about their children and growing up in this neighborhood that still had um, a lot of contaminants, even though it had greened in a lot of ways. So um, just to conclude with one more quote from an activist, this is a Earl Thurman again. And she said, um, we plot along as if we have all the time in the world for these problems to be resolved and come to a reasonable conclusion. And to be honest, we don't have a lot of time. We are on the same clock as the developers, businesses, and mother nature. It's whoever gets here first. And I'll end with that. Wow. Thank you, Dr. Tucker. <laughs> that was eye-opening. I'm now going to hand it over to Dr. Robert Rose, the executive director of the IIC, who's going to ask questions from attendees. Thank you, Erica. And Dr. Tucker, thank you again so much for being with us here tonight. Uh, we really appreciate uh, both the paper that inspired our uh, request to have you join us tonight and this talk tonight. Uh, we've had a fair number of questions, and I want to, there's a few that kind of fall into the same group of 
sort of what do we do? How do we move on from here? Because you could see that a lot of people care about sustainability and a lot of people care about green spaces and the importance of green spaces to our communities. So given the, the this effect of green gentrification that you talk about, how do you, one, find the balance between some of those seemingly positive ideas without leading to green gentrification? Is there a way forward to improve some of these cities? The Harlem example, I think, is a great example. Uh, and maybe improves the wrong word, but provide things like green space in these communities that can be very beneficial without it necessarily leading to green gentrification. Yeah, I really think there is. I mean, I think there's a way that, um, first of all, if you can, well, even if you can't entirely decouple it from real estate development, because um, the city maybe can't afford all of this green stuff on its own. But I mean, I think there are other ways to kind of, um, where the benefits of real estate development can be more equitably distributed. So perhaps there's, you know, if you're gonna support the creation of one park near like a new luxury development, maybe some of that money will go to support other parks and sort of try to really, um, and de Blasio has uh, put, sort of tried to institute some of these things. Um, they haven't all really worked out, but really just, you know, make sure that there's some that's enough that's going around for everybody or preserving affordable housing along with um, uh, private redevelopment. So making sure that, you know, uh, going beyond, uh, you know, what we have now, which is mandatory inclusionary zoning, but really trying to improve some of these more stable, um, affordable housing programs like uh, rents um, stabilization, you know, some of these programs that have, are more sort of have worked out for a longer term period for people and that aren't, um, yeah. So I, I think there's a lot of ways that you just, if, if you don't forget that, you know, everybody should be benefiting from these projects um, or that, that social sustainability is as much of a part of sustainability as the greening. Um, I think that there are lots of solutions that are out there that could probably be used um, or land trusts is another one that I think can really help preserve affordable housing and, and have greening at the same time. And, and maybe as an extension of that question, have you seen examples of where they've gotten this right, where they've been able to uh, bring in ideas of sustainability and green space into some of these neighborhoods where it didn't, because of the policies or the structure of the communication in place, it didn't necessarily lead to green gentrification? Yeah, I, I talked about these earlier today. So if the students are here again, forgive me for being repetitive. <laughs> but um, there's one example that I know of um, in DC in Anacostia, um, where they're building like a highline type bridge acro across the uh, river to Anacostia, across the Anacostia River. And they have created a land trust around the on the Anacostia side to preserve affordable housing so that and it's it's the area that's closest to the park, the new park. So um, it's gonna preserve affordable housing and also ensure that the people in that housing will you know, be the ones to benefit from the, I mean, other people can visit the park, it's public, but it'll ensure that they're not being pushed us to the side, that they're really actually getting the benefits of the park. And, and they got a lot of foundations in the area, nonprofits and um, donations to, to create that land trust. So that's one. Um, in Harlem, there was a park, another park on the river that they um, turned over the management, or not the management, they turned over the responsibility for creating and designing the park to a nonprofit mm -hmm. in the area as a kind of payback for um, uh, some, something else <laughs> uh, for contaminating them, which I won't go into that. But anyway, th the point is that the they turned, over, turned it over the planning to this community group and they fought off private developers who wanted to kind of bring in concessions and a hotel and they were you know, gonna contribute to the park's creation if they could locate on it or near it. And the community said no to all of it and they just created a, a simpler space. You know, It's not like a fancy highline type space, but it's a much simpler space, but it's actually really 
used by the whole community. Um, and it's, it's a space that everyone feels comfortable in too, which is the, you know, is sort of another thing that it's not restricted. It's like really with long-term residents and new residents in mind. So space where people really do come together. And uh, another question that came up, is this a, a uniquely US problem or do you see this happening in other parts of the world? No, it's definitely, it's amazing how global it is. And I actually co-edited a book um, that takes a global perspective and we have chapters in there from people from everywhere from Kigali in Uganda, which has a sustainability plan to, um, this isn't in the book, but there's um, somebody else who's done research in Nepal. Um, I mean, everywhere that you see redevelopment now, it's sort of in the name of greening and it's doing a similar kind of thing. And there's a lot of shanty towns that are being cleared and redeveloped. So it's, it's really, um, really a global phenomenon. And part of the reason for that is because uh, um, these consulting firms, there are these multinational consulting firms that develop these sustainability plans. And it's really like kind of the, the same f couple of firms developing them for um, governments all over the world. Hmm. I, I'm going to read one that's come up in, in our Q&A. It's an interesting one because it's a little forward looking as we start thinking about uh, climate change and, and uh, John talks about climate gentrification here. So uh, I'm going to read this question. Uh, since the 70s, cities have addressed urban disinvestment by creating uh, real estate development opportunities for the private sector as white flight has reversed in recent decades. Now that we are addressing the threat to climate change and coastal resiliency, we are looking to the private sector to pay for it and maybe environmental justice communities will once again be left out of this discussion. How do we highlight this so we do not have climate gentrification in the same way green gentrification is happening? Yeah, and, and I mean, that's another issue that um, people who I know are, are writing about, especially like in Florida, I think that's a big one where people are starting to want to move to higher ground. And um, it's definitely become, you know, a case of climate gentrification. I think the same, same kinds of things apply of just sort of making sure that, um, everybody is able to benefit and then it's not just it's so privatized and so relegated to the the pri private market that it, or left to the market i guess to determine who who's going to be um protected from climate change and who isn't so i think it's it's all part of the same same thing and uh we have a few minutes left i ha i have one that's uh, kind of been rattling around in my head if, if that's okay I'll, I'll take a moment to ask you um as we think about issues around uh, environmental justice, you, you highlight some of the really important topics that have been lingering for many, many years. With recent discussions around the Black Lives Matter movement, uh, some of the things that we've seen over the past year or so, some of that environmental justice discussion, I think for the positive has changed a little bit because it's focused uh, taking some of the focus on other issues around environmental justice, um, lack of participation in conservation programs, I think is a great example around the world. And so I'm wondering if you, if you could talk a little more broadly about the environmental justice movement and where you see it going over the next five to 10 years. Yeah, I mean, I actually write um, in my book, I didn't get to talk about it here, but I do write a lot about public participation, which is a huge part of um, environmental justice and sustainability and, and has, you know, definitely been an issue with conservation. I mean, I think a lot of conservation projects from what I know, because I have a lot of colleagues that write about that, um, they have expanded and they've gotten better and they've started to prioritize community input more sort of recognizing that in the very early days, you know, when they kind of kicked people off their land, that that wasn't such a great idea. <laughs> Um, and now they're doing more community-based conservation projects, which, you know, I think there's still a ways to go in terms of really considering the needs of local people and, I, you know, those tensions between local livelihoods and practices and conservation um, goals are, you know, still there, but I think there is more listening going on. I think it has a lot to do with, I mean, the environmental justice movement is 
pretty well organized and has been around since at least the late 1980s, early 1990s. And, and they've been, you know, very vocal and very much um, taking a stand in all kinds of local levels, but also organizing globally. And I think that it has really had an impact. So I think, you know, and it's, it's all again, it's connected and of a piece. And so I'm, I'm really hopeful. I think a lot of conservation organizations are really recognizing more and more that this is a problem. Excellent. Uh, and we've reached 730. I think that's a, a fantastic, maybe a little hopeful message to end <laughs> on. Uh, I'm going to pass it over to Erica for final words. Dr. Trecker, thank you so much for sharing your time and expertise with us tonight. Um, we really appreciate your insight into how we can become better advocates for environmental justice. Um, and to all our attendees, thank you for joining us tonight. If you're interested in learning more about how you can get involved with the IIC, please visit our website, um, wm.edu slash IIC and sign up for our listserv. Thank you all for joining us tonight and we look forward to connecting again with you soon. Good night. Thanks. Good night, everyone. Thank you.